Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? I just read a book that described the Antichrist. How could such a horrid creature exist? Doesn't the Apostle John teach us about the Antichrist in his epistles? Didn't I read about a man of sin, a son of perdition, that was to come in the last days? The description given by these apostles sure doesn't sound like the description I just read. I'm so confused. I don't know what to think. Doesn't this type of confusion sound like what we might hear in the church today? But these thoughts can be found in letters surviving from the medieval period in church history. The eschatology teachers from the medieval church carried their antichrist hysteria to the extreme. A classic example of this type of antichrist hysteria can be found in the New Testament apocryphal works called the Revelation of the Holy Theologian John. He wrote, The appearance of his face is gloomy, his hair like the points of arrows, his brows rough, his right eye as the rising morning star, and the left like a lion's. His mouth is a cubit wide, his teeth a span in length, his fingers are like sickles, his footprints are two cubits long, and on his head is the writing, Antichrist. Numerous other examples can also be found in surviving manuscripts from the medieval church. Where did these fanciful fits of imagination come from? Most of these descriptions came from the Sibylline oracles. One might think that the imagery and the symbolism provided by the Bible, especially the books of Daniel and Revelation, would be enough to fuel the study of eschatology for centuries. But this was not the case. Commencing in the second century AD, Christian authors began using other written materials to formulate their imagery of the apocalypse. These writings are called the Sibylline Oracles. In order to understand the Sibylline Oracles, we first must identify the Sibyl. The word is Greek in origin and has a meaning of a prophetess or oracle of hidden secrets. Generally, these oracles were female and they were known to utter prophecies in a frenzied, altered state of consciousness. Often this altered state of consciousness was induced by alcohol or hallucinogenic drugs such as the fungus ergot found on rye and wheat. The two most famous locations for these female sibyls were Delphi and Pessinos in Greece. The existence of sibyls date back to the Greek colonies of Asia Minor in the 8th century BC. But the first historical record of a Sibyl can be traced to the writings of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus in the 5th century BC. He wrote, The Sibyl, with frenzied mouth uttering things not to be laughed at, unadorned and unperfumed, yet reaches to a thousand years with her voice by aid of the gods. Later in antiquity, the Sibyls stepped away from fixed locations and wandered from place to place. Nowhere were the Sibyls more popular than in Rome. The early Sibylline oracles were a collection of these frenzied prophecies uttered by these Sibyls that were transcribed and written in Greek hexameter poetic style. Twelve books of the Sibylline oracles have survived from antiquity, but they have undergone extensive editing, rewriting, and redaction 
in order to Christianize these Greek and Roman pagan works. After the Christian redaction, the manuscripts were preoccupied with end-time themes, such as attacks on Jews and Christians, war, divine judgment, the coming of the Messiah, and a future glorious age. The oracles were extremely flexible and could be interpreted to suit the times due to their vague apocalyptic imagery. Why are the Sibylline Oracles so important? The Sibylline Oracles were treated with great respect by our early Christian fathers from the second century onward until their decline in the 18th century during the Age of Enlightenment. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, considered the Sibylline tradition so important that he included the Sibyl among the members found in the City of God. The medieval church considered the Sibylline oracles nearly equal to the Bible when studying eschatology. Once the removable type printing press was invented, the Sibylline oracles were printed in number, only surpassed by the Bible. The most important manuscript of the Sibylline Oracles was the Pseudo-Methodist, written in the 7th century AD by Methodist of Patara in the Byzantine Empire. In this work, we find the legend of the last world emperor and his struggle with the Antichrist first hypothesized. During the first centuries of the medieval period, apocalyptic theory about the millennium slumbered because the dominant religious and political authority was the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. The prevailing eschatology of Roman Catholicism during these centuries was amillennialism that originated with the writings of Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. Amillennialism does not view the eschatology of the Bible in a literal fashion, but interprets the books of Daniel and Revelation in an allegorical, symbolic fashion. This point of view does assert that Jesus Christ will eventually return in final judgment, but it denies the concept of a literal 1,000-year reign. Allegory and symbolism created a quagmire of competing theological opinions. No one questioned the amillennial argument that the 1,000-year millennium was the current church age, but they did argue about the Antichrist and the last world emperor. The identity of the Antichrist and the last world emperor became political weapons of propaganda used by the Roman papacy and antagonistic kings and rulers who resisted the totalitarian authority of Rome.